I am Dennis Gill with the Americans in Wartime Experience. Today's date is September 5th, 2023, and I've got the pleasure of speaking with Marshall Snyder out at the Tank Farm. Thank you, sir, for sitting down and talking to us. Thank you. If you could just give us a little bit of background on who you are. Uh, where were you born? Grow, where'd you grow up? Where'd you go to school? Stuff like that. Um, I was born in uh, Madigan Army Hospital, Fort Lewis, Washington. Uh, my father was an active duty Army infantry officer. He had just come back from Korean War, uh, Korea. Uh, so I was born in September 1955. Um, as a military brat, we moved all over the country. So I went to three elementary schools, two middle schools, three high schools. Uh, graduated in uh, 1973 from Princeton High School in New Jersey, okay. where my father headed up ROTC at Princeton University. I attended Washington Elite University in Lexington, Virginia from 73 to 77, and graduated in 77. And um, I had enrolled in the Army ROTC program, but found that somewhat lacking. So I joined the Marine Corps for two leaders course and attended summer camps at Quantico in uh, 1975 and 1976. Ironically, my first summer was at uh, Camp Upshur, which is about a half mile away from this farm. Okay. Um, I graduated in 73, or sorry, 77, was commissioned the same day, and started at the basic school at Quantico in June of uh, 77. Uh, graduated from that after six months, attended the basic communication officer school at Quantico, and was a Marine Corps communications officer, uh, which is a MOS 2502. Okay. Uh, I then served a tour in Okinawa, uh, served as a platoon commander. I then served at, in Norfolk as a staff officer. I was then assigned to um, Cherry Point, where I served as a uh, communications officer for Marine Aircraft Group uh, 32. And uh, in the summer of 1983, I was assigned as a communications officer for the 22nd Marine Amphibious Unit. Uh, at this time, there were two uh, amphibious units, uh, nicknamed MAUs, the 22nd and 24th, which were rotating in turn uh, as peacekeepers in Beirut, Lebanon. And uh, we served six month tours, deployed, uh, then came back, reconstituted, then deployed again. And typically the, the time back in the States was anywhere from three to four months before you had to mount up and go, go out again. Uh, okay. So in uh, October, uh, of uh, 1983, um, we left Moorhead City, and that was on the 18th of uh, October. And then uh, three days later, on the 21st, we were notified that we were heading south towards the Caribbean for an unexpected detour. And um, at the time, there were uh, issues in the little island of Grenada, and um, uh, it was a concern uh, for two reasons. First off, there was a medical school there and there were several hundred American students going to medical school in Grenada. And the country had been in some turmoil because there was a, a neo-communist uh, uh, government in charge. And at about the time we were sent south, there had been a, a, a bit of a coup d'etat and they had executed the leaders of the uh, ruling party. And there was a little bit of chaos in the country. So we were sent down to do what we thought might be a uh, a non-essential uh, evacuation of personnel, a nickname of the NEO, where we would uh, land troops at a landing zone, uh, round up the, uh, the students and evacuate them back out to our ships. Mm -hmm. And this was a mission that we routinely trained for in the Marine Corps, uh, having done that numerous times in uh, the Mediterranean, Africa, uh, and the Eurasian continent. So something that we were expecting and knew how to do. Um, what made it interesting was um, this was all very highly classified. It hadn't been leaked to the press. And we were in what's called emission control. So we could not send any messages off of our ships. And um, let me digress a little bit. Uh, a, at that time, a Marine amphibious unit consisted of about 2,000 Marines. We had a, a battalion landing team, 1st Battalion, 8th Marines out of uh, Camp Lejeune. Uh, Marine helicopter, uh, medium helicopter squadron 261 with uh, about 30 helicopters and, and, a, and a logistics support group. So about 2,000 Marines embarked on five Navy ships. 
I was on the USS Guam, which was a flagship. And we were uh, sort of a uh, co in command with the uh, amphibious uh, squadron, amphibious squadron mm -hmm. four. So our colonel and the captain of the uh, squadron were, were co commanders of this amphibious task force with different roles and different uh, ways of doing that. Um, so uh, on the 23rd of October, uh, we received a warning order that we would have to execute an operation in Grenada. Uh, we had no maps, no intelligence hardly. Um, one of our, one of the staff officers in the Fibron had actually been there before on a sailing trip a decade before and gave us kind of a general layout of what the situation was in terms of where we might land. Um, one of the officers in our unit had actually landed at one of the airfields in Grenada. Uh, and at the time, there were two airfields, uh, Pearls, which was a small airfield on the eastern side of the island, uh, very primitive, very small. But the Cubans were building a 10,000 foot runway down at Point Salines in the southern end of the island. So as a result, there were approximately a thousand Cubans uh, in Grenada, some military, but mostly civilian workers, although many of them had been in the militia or been in the Cuban army. So the thought was that these, would, these Cubans would, would form up with the Grenadian military and become a serious resistance to us. So unbeknownst to us aboard ship, the United States was mounting a rather large operation to go in and do specific tasks related to various things on the island. Uh, there was involvement with Delta Force, uh, Special Operations people, what was then called SEAL Team 6, uh, Army Rangers. And the concept was that the Marines would land at Pearl's Airfield, CZ. The Rangers would land and seize the Point Salines Airfield. And there'd be some Special Operations uh, units that would hit other places on the island, capture the radio tower or the radio station, capture the prison where there might be some uh, important Grenadian prisoners. Um, and almost all those operations were total failures. Um, they were uh, shot up, uh, forced to retreat, forced to swim out to another ship. In one case, uh, they dropped uh, a SEAL team in the water and four of the SEALs drowned in the surf. So. The only successful special operation was the Rangers seizing the airfield. So while they seized the airfield, um, our Marine uh, landed at Pearl, seized that, seized the town of Grenville just to the south of that, and established our position against really no opposition. Uh, most of the Grenadian soldiers sort of fired a few shots and fled. But um, there is some serious opposition now where the Rangers were. And the plan was to land the Rangers, then fly in elements of the 82nd Airborne Division who would then move out and occupy the area and rescue the students. Unfortunately, though, um, the Rangers and the Airborne had no mobility. They had no vehicles other than what they might capture, and essentially they were static on the ground. And they fought some firefights, but essentially for about the first 12 hours, um, they were stuck there. They did rescue some students at the campus. We then found out there was another 150 students at another location on the island that they couldn't get to. So at this point, uh, the overall commander, Admiral Metcalf, decided that he needed to use the flexibility of his amphibious forces. So he directed that our amphibious force move around the island and capture the, the capital, St. George's of Grenada, from the western side of the island. So um, in the middle of the night, um, we re-embarked one company of Marines um, moved around the island, leaving one company at Pearls, uh, landed one company by amphibious tractors uh, with tanks, another by air, and by um, pretty much the end of, uh, of the morning, we had captured the capital, ca uh, relieved the SEALs who were stuck with the uh, uh, Governor General Schoon, who was the governor there, who had been trapped by, uh, who was with SEALs, but was trapped by Grenadian forces. Um, and had essentially broken the back of any resistance. And um, from that point on, the, we maintained uh, security of pearls, sent out patrols looking for enemy uh, pocket of resistance, capturing thousands and thousands of weapons in various warehouses and local depots. Uh, and after about three days, we finally linked up with the Airborne, who had moved probably four or five miles in that three or four day period. They were on foot uh, and had no mobility. Eventually, there were six battalions of airborne troops on the island and one battalion of U.S. Marines. Uh, as it turned out, 
uh, because the Marines had tactical mobility. We had tanks, landing craft, vehicles, helicopters. Mm -hmm. We captured about two thirds of the island while well, the Army captured the other uh, one third with their uh, six battalions of infantry. Um, but really all resistance pretty much ended on the, uh, after about the second day. And at that point it became kind of an intelligence collection operation. We gathered up all these weapon systems. Uh, at one point the Army did a helo assault into Kavigny barracks, had a horrible collision of two helicopters and killed a number of soldiers who were there. But essentially, uh, but there was no one there. They just crashed and, and right. people were killed. So uh, on the, uh, let me see, on the 29th of October, we backloaded back to our ships, moved north to another island called Caracal, uh, which had probably uh, you know, 20 or 30 soldiers on it, uh, landed our troops ashore there, no resistance. People were happy to see us, you know, gave us food and flowers and soft drinks mm -hmm. to drink. At that point, we backloaded back to our ships and headed across the Atlantic to to Spain. As a communications officer, my job was to maintain communications between uh, my headquarters on USS Guam and our Marine forces ashore, which is a real challenge because the Guam had some serious communications problems with their equipment, and we had forces all over the island. So I had to very had to jury rig some equipment to get everything to, to work halfway decently. Mm -hmm. um, we had uh, really no communications with the Army. Um, I actually went ashore twice during the operation, once to link up with the Army Airborne communications folks. That never worked out. They never talked to us. And once to go ashore and meet my counterpart in the battalion to make sure that he had all the information and the equipment he needed to do his operations. Uh, I think overall the Marine Corps did an outstanding job. Uh, we were flexible. Uh, we had good fire discipline. Our troops did a superb job. Um, one of the most interesting flexibilities was uh, our battalion had a battery of artillery with us. Uh, mm -hmm. We didn't need artillery, so we turned all those infantrymen into grunts and had them ashore guarding prisoners and running patrols. So um, our helicopter squadron was superb. They did a great job. But it's during the first day of operations, we had two helicopters shot down, two Cobra gunships. And uh, we lost three of our Marine aviators. One was badly wounded, but he was recovered. So those were our only losses, other than some minor wounds from some of the Marines in the battalion. Yeah. Uh, so overall, I thought the Marines did a great job. It was not well coordinated at the higher command levels. But I think as a result of Grenada, our military learned an awful lot about how to run joint operations and allowed us to mesh further on in the future. Right. And if you see that as kind of a predecessor, how Desert Storm worked, it was an incredible improvement in how we ran operations. Yeah. Well, let me ask you, were the students there, were they ever, were they being held hostage or were they, no. were they ever in real in any danger that we know of or? Um, no, I, I think that the, Grenadian government, such as it was, kind yeah. of made a point that they were not going to use them as hostages. But, I mean, there were people running around with weapons and shooting indiscriminately. Right, right. And um, on the second day of the operation, um, when the Army found out that there was this group of students who were not at the, at the campus, uh, the Marine Corps brought in all those helicopters, picked up a couple of dozen Rangers, yeah. Flew them into Grand Dance Bay, picked up all the students, and then flew back to the uh, to the main airfield and rescued them. So it was a, and what made it interesting was the uh, uh, the Marine helicopter commander uh, um, was a classmate of the Army Ranger commander at at VMI. So they actually knew each other, and they coordinated the whole operation from a command and control helicopter, and it was like great choreography, helicopters yeah. swirling around in the air and landing and picking up these, uh, uh, dropping off the rangers, set up perimeter, picking up the students and lifting them out, coming back, picking up the rangers. And it was a really well done operation in that little bit. So I have a lot of regard for the rangers because they were also very flexible, uh, very mission oriented uh, and, did a, and they did a great job. Yeah. What were the uh, objectives pretty much accomplished? I mean, um, yeah, so if, if the mission was to rescue the students, that was done. No right. students were hurt or, or, or killed in the operation. Uh, if the objective was to eliminate Cuban influence in Grenada, that was a success. Uh, 
I'm not sure that it was worth the 19 or so right. servicemen who were killed in the operation, but um, but certainly it, it uh, gave uh, Grenada a, a new chance to form a democratic government, which they apparently have. And now, of course, it's a great tourist location. Right, uh, right. Well, where do you go from there? You said you were going to Spain? Well, right? so we were, we had left in uh, uh, Moorhead City, headed to relieve the 24th Mao in Beirut. Okay. And um, so we landed on the 25th. Two days earlier is when the barracks had been blown up in Beirut, which killed you know, 260 odd, you know, Marine sailors and soldiers who were in this one building. And um, so, after a delay at Grenada, we proceeded to row to Spain, which was a usual kind of a turnover point for for the Marines going into the Mediterranean. Right. And um, I got I flew off the ship, was on the advance party, so I flew from uh, Spain to Sigonella, Italy from Siganella to Cyprus, and then flew my helicopter into, into Beirut. So that allowed me to meet up with my counterpart in the 24th Mao and start the changeover. So uh, several days later, which would have been the uh, 17th of November, we had a formal turnover, and the 22nd Mao took charge of, uh, of the uh, operations of the shore in Beirut. Um, and at this point, you know, the mission had kind of changed from you know, peacekeeping and helping the Lebanese army fight these various insurgent groups essentially became a mission of don't get killed. And right. we began a big campaign of digging ourselves in around into our uh, into various bunkers and locations around, uh, once again, around an airfield. We, we were at Beirut International Airfield. Uh, we had a large detachment of a reinforced rifle platoon um, up at the American Embassy, which is actually the British Embassy, because U.S. Embassy had been destroyed several months earlier in another car bomb. Uh, so uh, when I flew in, uh, what was interesting was because we were aboard ship, we had no access to newspapers or U.S. media, no news reports. So we had no real visceral impact of the of the bombing mm -hmm. in Beirut. Uh, many of us knew people who were there because it was the sister battalion of our battalion. It was one aid and we, were, we had two aid. So they knew dozens of people who were killed or injured. But by the time we got there, you know, everyone had been evacuated. The barracks was just a large pile of rubble. And, um, you know, we were all kind of hyped up on our victory in Grenada. So, you know, we kind of came in and, and our counterparts in the 24th Mount headquarters had not been impacted by the bombing in terms of casualties. So mm -hmm. we had a good turnover with them. The, uh, the rifle companies were not impacted by the, the bombing. It was mainly the headquarters company of 1-8 that was destroyed. So there was a fairly easy transition uh, that happened when we came in. So we were essentially dug in around the, the airport. And um, what made it even more interesting was when we first got there, the airport was still open. So there's still people working in the airport facilities, kind of around and between our various units. Mm -hmm. And then outside our perimeter was a combination of various uh, groups, Druze, uh, Shiites, uh, Shias, all with various militia groups. Lebanese Christians were kind of the good guys. Everybody else was kind of the bad guys. And um, <laughs> Beirut was a very divided city, ethnically or religiously. And at nighttime, we could sit on top of our bunkers and watch them shooting at each other. I mean, literally shooting, you know, 20 millimeter, uh, uh, you know, machine guns at buildings and blowing up, you know, parts of high rise buildings and shooting rockets. And, constant machine gun and fire but during the daytime they kind of went about their own business right uh, so we were kind of trapped in between that and occasionally we would get involved in a firefight where you know someone from one of the militia groups would engage one of our outposts we would engage back they would engage and we tended to do a, an escalation if they fired you know ak-47 we fire machine guns back if they fired machine guns back we might try borders at one point, uh, the battalion had a persistent uh, sniper in a building. So the battalion commander, uh, who was a interesting uh, guy nicknamed E. Tool Smith, later a major general in the Marine Corps, ordered his tank platoon to blow the building to pieces. So they blew out the first floor and collapsed it on top of all the snipers and killed them. So it was that kind of a, a, of a back and forth. Yeah. If they engaged us, we would engage back, but we did not 
you know, we did not engage ourselves. Uh, we had a lot of intelligence assets involved, you know, trying to figure out what was going on, you know, who was who. Um, but but essentially, you know, we were just dug in. Uh, the biggest uh, thing that happened was on 4 December, uh, like the day before, um, one of the carrier battle groups off the coast had launched a reconnaissance flight over the Bacaw Valley further to the I guess, uh, east of us, and they had been shot at. So unbeknownst to us until much later, they were planning what they called an alpha strike, a, a large 20-plane you know, strike against these various uh, positions in the Bacaw Valley. Mm -hmm. Well, it was not very successful. They shot down two of the Navy airplanes, an A-6 and an A-4. Um, the A-4 crew, I think the pilot was killed and the BN survived. He was later rescued uh, by an American preacher. I think it might have been Jesse Jackson came in and got him out. Uh, but that night, uh, we were engaged in a very heavy firefight with one of the militia groups. Um, and as it escalated, they fired uh, a mortar and hit one of our positions, which killed eight Marines and wounded two. And that was the worst day uh, of the entire revolution. Uh, I was involved in that because uh, my communications unit was co-located with the battalion aid station. Okay. And... Um, uh, because the corpsman had helped my Marines do sandbags, we said, we'll help you out if there's any casual situation. So when the Amtrak came up with the dead and wounded on board, my, the Marines and I helped unload the bodies of the wounded Marines. And that was a pretty dramatic and, and rough day for all of us. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, but for the most part, you know, we dug ourselves in. Uh, at Christmas time, um, my headquarters actually moved from our location in the middle of the airfield to the outskirts of the airfield by the ocean. So we had a new position. So it was the ocean, the coast road, our positions, and then there was the airfield. And um, a little bit safer, and we literally dug ourselves in. Um, our logistics folks went up to the port and stole about 100 cargo containers, 20 and 40 footers, dug big ditches and buried these containers in the ground, and that became where we lived and worked. So, for example, uh, I had a 220-foot uh, container side by side buried 20 feet underground. I slept in one with my assistant, and the other part, half of it was where my radios were mm -hmm. and my switchboard. So everything was underground at that point. Uh, we even had a few tunnels between some of these, uh, these bunkers. Um, and I had... I had approximately 35 Marines who worked for me. Um, I maintained, uh, uh, I had divided them up into essentially into three and four man teams. And they ran a continual radio watch 24 hours a day, seven days a week in our radio, in our combat operations center. I had some more Marines working essentially message center, teletype type messages. We had a Navy van there for that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I had one set of Marines who were on guard duty. And these Marines would rotate through various jobs. So the Marines on guard duty essentially manned a, a perimeter position. You know, they had an M60 machine gun, a couple of laws, and their own M16. So uh, what struck home with me at that time was, was that um, my Marines were not really well prepared in infantry weapons. They were communications uh, Marines. They all qualified with the M16, right. but that was about it. So uh, later on, when uh, General Gray became Commandant, he made sure that every single Marine went through infantry combat training, which would have given my Marines a better idea of how to use their M60, for example. Yeah. So I think as a result of some of the operations in Beirut and Grenada, uh, the Marine Corps saw that all Marines needed to be back to being a rifleman and not just, you know, a truck mechanic or a radio operator or an admin clerk. Right. Uh, but you know, we essentially had our own perimeter. Um, it was pretty primitive. Um, you know, we lived underground. We generally got uh, one or two hot meals a day, uh, and um, it sometimes it was supplemented by some food from they bought out in town. We occasionally had fruit, sometimes bread, but usually just what were called tray packs, large thermostabilized cans of food they dished out. Mm -hmm. I remember we primarily was a, sort of a ground up beef dish was all we had, and, and eggs for breakfast. Um, it was very, actually, very, uh, very uh, mediocre food and very monotonous after right. a while. Um, one interesting thing was 
uh, because we were ashore, uh, we had a beer mess. And Navy Marine rated two beers a day. And one of my corporals uh, ran the beer mess for the 100 or so Marines in our unit. And uh, he kept a beer, he draw beer every day uh, from the uh, logistics folks, store it under his rack, then collect the money, give out two beers, and then so every Marine had a chance to have a beer every night if he so wanted. Right. Um, and that was a real morale booster. In fact, some of the Navy personnel would come ashore just to have a beer since the Navy had no beer on their ships. Um, the ship sat off uh, uh, just out of range uh, of uh, enemy artillery or whatever. So we, we sometimes but rarely saw a ship. The one ship we saw almost all the time was the USS New Jersey, you know, the reconditioned battleship. She was the first battleship mm -hmm. to be reconditioned and she deployed off of Beirut for a couple of months. Uh, very impressive. I think she fired twice uh, while we were there. And that's very impressive because uh, it was at nighttime and it was pitch black, you couldn't see anything. And all of a sudden the sky would light up and you'd see a silhouette of the ship. And then you'd hear the, the rounds both above ground and underground because the sound came up through the water to our beach. Yeah. But my understanding was they weren't very accurate you know, 45 year old gunpowder, and I'm not sure they had a lot of successful missions when they did that. They didn't fire twice while I was there. Yeah. Um, but um, what really made it for us was the fact that um, as an embark Marine unit, um, we were very self contained, and we had, let's say, 30 days of supply aboard our ships, and we had our own squadron of helicopters. So every day we'd have helos come in with, you know, resupply. Uh, we had sent people back out the ship to get showers or to do laundry, then come back to shore. Um, but um, we had a very robust uh, logistics effort from the ships. And um, supplies would come into Cyprus. They would then be heloed out to the USS Guam, then heloed ashore to, to where we were, then distributed by Jeep to all the units uh, on the front lines and mm -hmm. in the rear. Um, but we were uh, you know, fully prepared to go to combat. We had an artillery battery. Uh, we had a uh, tank platoon, you know, we had three rifle companies, a recon platoon. We had uh, a really good set of intel assets. Uh, we had a SIGINT capability, counter intel capability. We even had a firefinder radar so we could track enemy shells. If they came to our position, we could fire back from where the shell came right. from. So we were a very robust and self-contained unit. But uh, in uh, probably late January, the Lebanese army fell apart and essentially gave up and went home. And the militia groups began to take over you know, the city. Uh, and we, at that point, we no longer really had a mission. Uh, you know, the original mission was to evacuate PLO okay. and they were long gone. Uh, so we eventually uh, were told to start evacuating and, and by, let's see, uh, by the 24th of February, we were backloaded back on our ships. Uh, and now we just sat off the coast in case another mission came up. Yeah. Uh, and we did that for another month or so. And then eventually uh, went back to Road to Spain. Uh, we did a, a wash down there. We had to wash all the mud off our vehicle. Then we backloaded, we're back at Camp Lejeune in the beginning part of May. A question for you. You said you, you got to Beirut, what, two days after the, the attack? No, no. It was like uh, almost a month. Almost a month. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we were, you know, it, it's 10 days to cross the Atlantic yeah. by ship, and then another three or four days to cross by the Mediterranean. Okay. And we had to Grenada. I think we had to go through. So. Okay. Were you en route, though, to Beirut before Grenada? Yes. And then diverted? Yes. In fact, I remember as a communications officer, I often saw the first messages. Uh, so uh, one of my Marines woke me up at like two in the morning, and started giving me a series of messages about the Beirut bombing. And it was a, you know, a continual you know, load of messages, all top secret flash, right. highest priority thing, you know, people have been killed, you know, number unknown. You know, and each day and each hour, they casually list got bigger and bigger. But that's all we really saw with this message. Never saw any pictures until yeah. you know, way later. And this is pre, pre Grenada. Yes, for you, Grenada. How does that, how does it affect your mindset when that's going on over there and now you're here, you've got another mission, so you've got to completely 
put that out of your mind, I guess, and try to focus on, on what's going on now. Is that even uh, possible? Well, so... Especially given that you, you guys had a connection to the, the unit that was over there. So, the Marines have been running, you know, units in the Mediterranean since the end of World War, since after World War right. II. And typically, they're six-month deployments, and you essentially, you know, go around the Mediterranean doing various landing exercises. So, at any given time, you might be planning three or four of those at a time. Mm -hmm. When we left uh, Moorhead City, we were actually planning an exercise in Spain. So it really wasn't that hard to kind of turn our, you know, our planning evolution to Grenada because we already had essentially a standing operations order. You know, we knew how we were going to land. We knew the logistics. We had a communications plan already worked up. So it's just a matter of kind of turning that around to a different location, a different set of maps, different set of intel. Um, the bombing in Beirut, uh, really wasn't that impactful because it, it wasn't really visceral to us. Mm -hmm. It was just, you know, we knew it had happened, but we are so focused on what we are currently doing that, you know, we really weren't focused on it very much. Uh, gotcha. I personally didn't know anybody uh, at the time in Beirut. Uh, one of my friends, though, a guy named Chuck Daly, he was badly injured in the bombing. Uh, actually was given last rites at one point, but survived and ended up serving 30 years in the Marine Corps. Uh, but he's the only real survivor baby that I know. Um, right. I'd actually come from Cherry Point, North Carolina, and the battalion was from Camp Lejeune, so I had no contact with them before the bombing. So you're, how long are you over there? So we were there from uh, mid-November until the end of February. Okay. Um, and uh, then we spent about a month sitting off the coast we, right. pulled, we pulled four or five days of liberty in Israel, and then we you know, backloaded to uh, uh, to Spain, did a turnover with the 24th Mal, which was coming back in, then we went back to the States. And then um, we had 87 days back in the States before we left again for another tour in the Mediterranean. Wow. Uh, so at that time, there were two East Coast Mal's. Now there's three uh, East Coast units that rotate six months out a year back six months out a year back okay so were, were you married at the time i was not married at the okay. time okay uh, i thank goodness for yeah that. yeah uh, but i mean it was you know uh, most of the married guys used to that the marine corps had long yeah. since gone to a unit deployment scheme where you would deploy for six months to japan or six months aboard ship and be back for a year or 18 months so marine families were fairly used to that yeah, um, and you knew ahead of time you were going through that cycle. So, I think most of the wives were able to survive that. But uh, the Grenada operation, we are totally out of communication with anybody. This is before the days of email and phones on ships. So, mm -hmm. when we were at sea, we had literally no communications at all, except by you know, really by naval messages, by except by telegraph. Yeah. Um, so, um, I did another deployment. Um, after the Grenada Beirut operations, uh, no, this time it was seven months in the Mediterranean. This one was a peacetime deployment. We deployed and sailed you know, Spain, Italy, France, uh, Turkey, uh, Morocco, Tunisia. So we were all over the Mediterranean uh, and gone for seven months. Yeah. Uh, so I came back from that and, and back to Trade Point for a few months and did a, uh, a year at school at Quantico then deployed to Japan for um, 15 months. I then uh, was stationed in California where I joined the 13th Marine Expeditionary Unit, which was one of the West Coast counterparts of my old unit, the 22nd. So at that point, there were six units in the Marine Corps that deployed, three on the East Coast and three on the West Coast. And uh, uh, on the West Coast, we did six month deployments to uh, at that time to the Western Pacific, uh, Philippines, Korea, Japan, Thailand, Australia, pretty mm -hmm. much. Uh, but on my second deployment, uh, we actually left uh, San Diego in, in uh, June of 1990. And it's like 25 or 30 days across, to, across the Pacific Ocean, the long haul. Uh, we were in the Philippines for about a month. And then uh, Saddam Hussein invaded uh, Kuwait. And uh, we were put on alert that we would deploy. And um, 
but we actually went to Hong Kong for, for some liberty. Came back to uh, Subic Bay and picked up another battalion of Marines. So we actually had two battalions on our on our five ships. Mm -hmm. And I mean, every rack in the ship was filled. And um, in addition to being the communications officer, I was also headquarters commandant, which is like the company commander. I had about 100 Marines who worked for me administratively. I was also the executive officer of troops on the ship. So I was a, had a direct liaison relationship with the Navy in terms of, uh, of you know, cooks and bakers and, and uh, augmentees mm -hmm. and fight deck crew. And, and uh, so I had to essentially fill every rack on that ship with a Marine and realize that uh, we then sailed to the Gulf of Oman. Uh, this was in uh, August and September. So it's you know, Indian Ocean, the Persian Gulf area. It's 100 degrees outside. And our ship is 28 years old with mediocre air conditioning. So it was a real challenge to, yeah. on the ship. It was very, very cramped. There are lines everywhere for, for, for chow. Yeah. But as soon as we got to Oman, we offloaded our other battalion, which was 1st Battalion, 6 Marines. Um, and then um, we were joined by the uh, 4th Marine Expeditionary Brigade, 4th MEB, which came out of uh, the East Coast. And uh, it was headed by, I think, uh, General Jenkins. So we became part of the 4th MEB, but kind of a special attachment because we were special operations capable. We had a lot of extra training, a lot of extra capabilities that other Marine Corps units did not have. Uh, hostage rescue, uh, other types of operations, raids, rubber boat training, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. So we were a part of the 4th MEB, but also kind of we weren't really subsumed into that. We remained our own commander and our own uh, subunit within the 4th MEV. And um, we spent, uh, I guess it was about two months deployed off of Oman. We landed one time for exercise and spent about a week ashore you know, just getting our feet dry and getting the vehicles out and running them around and, and doing some basic training in the desert. Um, but then in um, late November, we were, we were told, you're going home. In the Navy, we deploy for six months and we go home. So we actually left the, the Persian Gulf area and we're headed back to the uh, United States. But then we're, we're uh, sailing off the coast of uh, India one day and we realized that, hey, the ship's pointed in a different direction. Wait, we're going in circles, what's going on? Well, apparently they decided that we weren't gonna leave the operations area, but we were going to the Philippines for a, a month and a half, train there, then come back to the Persian Gulf. So we, uh, we spent uh, most of December uh, in the Philippines doing intensive training, a lot of time in the field, mm -hmm. a lot of weapons training. Uh, I had to train all the Marines in my headquarters unit to be infantrymen as replacements. So all my mm -hmm. cooks and bakers and candlestick makers and communicators were trained to be infantrymen. Right. I had to teach them fire team and squad tactics. So uh, real big emphasis on NBC training. Um, first aid, that type of thing. So uh, we had trained up all my Marines to be you know, replacements if, if the battalion had any casualties. Uh, I, we had no idea what the big picture was back in, uh, in, the, in uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, we were kind of on the outskirts of that. But uh, we headed back uh, in late December, spent uh, like four days in Singapore on Liberty, and then went back to the Persian Gulf and actually entered the Persian Gulf the day the air war started. And at the time, we were the only Marine, Embark Marine unit in the actual Persian Gulf. All the rest were off of Oman. And okay. by this point, the 5th MEB had joined from uh, the West Coast. So now the Marine forces afloat, I guess they consisted of probably seven battalions of Marines and artillery battalions and uh, Harriers. And I mean, uh, almost, a, almost a full division of Marines were embarked on amphibious ships. Okay. And I think we probably had almost every amphibious ship in the Navy embarked out there with us. Um, we went into the Persian Gulf and sort of spent some time uh, doing some exercise and planning, and we were kind of designated as a raid force. And um, we kept getting these operational orders to, uh, to do a long distance helicopter raid on an Iraqi held island. Uh, I think we did, uh, we did, we actually did one, we planned a couple more, the one that we did do, I think, was on called was called Meridim Island, and when we got there, the Iraqis had just left. We captured a lot of weapons, a lot of intelligence information, 
but you know everyone knew that the Iraqis were, had dropped mines all over the area near uh -huh. Kuwait. So none of the Navy ships wanted to get too close to that because a uh, mine would have been you know, devastating to any of the Navy ships in that area. So we essentially stayed uh, kind of uh, off the coast of Saudi Arabia, uh, but not but not too far from Kuwait. Eventually, um, the rest of the Marines uh, afloat, uh, the 4th and 5th Mebs joined us, and um, we became kind of the uh, diversion force. Our job really was to convince the Iraqis that we were going to land on the coast of Kuwait right. and invade from that from that way. Meanwhile, the 1st and 2nd Marine Divisions were going, you know, actually did the actual you know, incursion into Kuwait while the Army did the big, uh, big hook around uh, into to Iraq. So uh, by the time the ground war started, um, some of the Marines from the 5th Meb had actually landed ashore, but by the time they actually got ashore, the ground war had ended. Uh, but um, we did have one operation left, uh, and that was um, there is an island off the coast of Kuwait called Falaka Island, and uh, it had been bombed and you know, been uh, attacked by, naval, by various naval air assets. They knew they were Iraqis ashore there, so our job was to go in and effect their surrender. Um, so, on the third of the third of March, 1991, the 13th U conducted a POW raid on Falaka Island uh, with a couple of rifle companies. Uh, I was ashore as part of the uh, our command element. Our colonels accepted the surrender of the. I don't know, 333rd uh, Iraqi Marine Brigade, which was about 1,400 Iraqi soldiers. Um, so the big problem was getting them off the island. So mm -hmm. what we did was uh, we had a very thorough process. We put it like it was a civilian evacuation. And um, one of the ships, our LPD, emptied out their well deck, uh, came up out of the water, and turned their well deck into a POW camp, set up some essentially porta potties in the well deck and put a couple of machine gun nests up on the upper deck so that they could go down there. And uh, we organized um, the Iraqis into 15-man sticks. And we had a series of helos coming in, picking them up at 15 at a time, or in a C-53, 45 at a time. They were all flex-cuffed, the weapons taken from them had all been searched. So they go through the search, um, they be flex-cuffed, put on a helicopter phone out to the, it might have been the Ogden, and they were put in this POW well deck. We had 1,400 Iraqis in this well deck. Um, mm. And um, very smooth, and we were done by, uh, by dinner time. So we came ashore. Uh, our intel guys did some exploitation, captures and weapons, you know, a lot of documentation. Evacuated 1,400 Iraqis. Then we pulled ourselves back. And then uh, that was our big operation for the, uh, for the war. Um, and, uh, Several days later, we were released, and uh, 45 days later, we were back in San Diego. We were deployed 302 days, mm. uh, one of the longest deployments in Marine Corps history uh, aboard the ship. Um, and um, uh, the only casualties we had were two helicopters that had been in a mid-air collision, killed eight Marines uh, back in October uh, mm. during a training evolution at night. Uh, those were our only casualties. It was a long deployment, and yeah. I still wasn't married at that point, so okay. no big deal for me. Yeah. But my roommate, for example, uh, on our first deployment in you know, the 13th Mew, his daughter was born one month into the deployment, so we didn't see her for five months. And then now we were gone for 10 months. We didn't see his family and his four kids for 10 months at that wow. point. So rough on some of the married guys. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, uh, what made it rougher was we had little access to telephones, except when we were actually ashore on Liberty. Mail was you know, not existent, but uh, hard to get to yeah. you know, as, it, as the mail chases around the Persian Gulf and the Indian Ocean. So we typically might go two weeks without getting any mail. Then you come into port and get like two letters. A week later, you get 40 letters and you know, all the other stuff. So very, uh, very irregular. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, you know, compared to the Marines, I'm sure, you know, I had a hot shower every day. I had three square meals a day. I got to run on the flight deck, you know, usually once or twice a day if, if they were doing helo operations. 
in the Navy when you're deployed for 60 days at sea, I think you get you rate two beers. So we had a couple of steel beach parties with beer. So compared to the grunts who were uh, you know, in the first, right. first and second divisions, we had it pretty easy. But we were there a lot longer than they were. Yeah. So. But I guess life on a ship, though, for that long has got to wear on you after a while, right? I mean, you're confined, even though you're you're running around the flight deck and you're still limited in what you can do, right? And you're and you're packed in there tight. And yeah. So, uh, yes. So uh, it was probably, I mean, my marine communicators had a mission on the ship. We were working in the communication center. We manned radio watches. I could keep my guys pretty busy. Our, our staff, our staff sections were really busy doing plans and logistics planning. Uh-huh. Really, the infantry guys had it roughest because um, you know, they couldn't, they couldn't really do a lot of stuff. So they they go down to the hangar deck and do squad maneuvers. They go up the flight deck and they shoot weapons off the flight deck. Um, you know, maybe they get some helo training and go off and spend a, an hour flying around the task force. You know, uh, in the helicopters and come back and you know do PT in the flight deck. So. The uh, we kept people pretty busy. Yeah. I mean, you know, we uh, everyone got three meals a day. We had a, you know two movie channels at night on on TV. Um, I think uh, the ship did a cruise book, and I think one of the statistics they came up with that the Coke machine they sold one million sodas on our deployment. Wow. Um, so you know we had sodas. I mean, yeah. So it, it could have been a lot rougher. Yeah. You're not in mop gear, I'm assuming. No, no. <laughs> so but we. But at one point before the the round war started, we were mop here an, an hour every day. Okay. Uh, just to kind of get used to it. Yeah. Uh, but we stayed pretty busy. We also did a couple of special operations, uh, where our force recon and our, our seals did uh, ship takedowns. We actually captured three Iraqi tankers in October and November uh, as they were trying to get back to uh, to Iraq to uh, uh, straight to Fort Moon. So we captured three Iraqis. And that was pretty interesting because the Marines in Force Recon had to fast reel down to the deck mm-hmm. while the SEALs were in helos with sniper teams kind of circling in, in Hueys while they captured the ship. So, uh, so we did that uh, three times, I think, while we were there. And that was the first time the Marines had ever been involved in those type of takedowns. And now it's much more routine. In fact, yeah. I think right now there's, there's Marines on tankers guarding against the Iranians taking our ships down. So that became kind of a new mission for Marine right. the Float to do that. Yeah. So uh, I got back from Desert Storm. Uh, it must have been uh, April. Uh, I left Camp Pendleton in, in May. Uh, moved to the East Coast of Quantico. Spent three years there. Met my wife. Got married. Um, I spent three years teaching school at Quantico. I spent three years at Headquarters Marine Corps as a staff officer. Then I retired in 1997. Okay. Is there anything you didn't get to do you wish you did in the Marine Corps? I, you know, when you're at the basic school, you're assigned, initially assigned, uh, essentially a basic Marine officer. You get to right. uh, you know, put in a selection for the MOS if you wanted. I got my third choice, which was communication. I wanted to be infantry or artillery. I got my third choice. And on uh, thinking back on that, it was probably the best thing that probably happened to me. Because we spent a lot of time uh, in the Fleet Marine Force, a lot of time deployed, a lot of opportunities to, to do interesting things, mm-hmm. uh, a lot of time afloat. I, I had a really good time in the Marine Corps. Yeah. I was a platoon commander seven times. I was a company commander one time. Um, at the same time, I was a platoon commander. Um, so I had a lot of chance to work with a lot of really good Marines, a lot of outstanding staff, non commissioned officers. Yeah. I, you know, I had I had great troops working for me all the time, and uh, it was just a great experience. Yeah. Um, so do I regret anything I didn't do? I mean, I, I had a chance. I did a I did a spy rig one time. I fast roped on the ships a couple times. You know, I did a I did a helo assault on an enemy island once. Um, you know, I deployed you know four times on ship. You know, in the Mediterranean and, and the Pacific. Visited 20 countries on the Marine Corps dime. And, uh, so, no, not really. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It was a good experience overall. Yeah. So how do you think, looking back on it, uh, how does that shape who you, who you eventually became, who you are now? Um, I don't know. You know, 
you're pretty well formed when you're uh, uh, when you get to uh, when you join the Marine Corps. I mean, I, I wasn't 18, you know, right. going to boot camp. I was a 22 year old when I got to the basic school, so I think I pretty much uh, had a good idea what was going on. I do remember one of my key moments of my career was uh, in my second summer at Officer Candidate School. Uh, we had a, a drill instructor as our uh, as a senior. We had a young corporal as our sergeant instructor who had never been a drill instructor, uh, Corporal Ponsler. And, you know, he was, we had the good cop, bad cop kind of relationship between yeah. the, the two staff MCOs. And Ponsler was the bad cop. And he harassed us unmercifully, you know, <laughs> open, trying to get our wall lockers open, messing up our racks, you know, digging us on, uh, you know, for, for this and that on inspections. But on the last day, as we're about to leaving, about to leave, you know, get on the bus to go to the airport and fly home. He said, Snyder, you're okay. That was like a high point for me at, at OCS to have a Marine Corporal say, right. I, I think you're an okay guy. I wouldn't mind you being my, my officer. So yeah. that kind of set the tone for me that, you know, I, I thought it was important that, you know, a Marine officer took care of his troops. And it's not just a matter of, you know, the troops eat last and the officers eat. It's really taking care of your troops and encouraging them and, getting them to training and helping them grow in the Ramble West and giving them opportunities to lead and to, to do things and to, you know, do better things. And um, uh, I think that was probably my, the best part of the Marine Corps for me was having all these Marines work for me. Yeah. Uh, so I I had a chance to be with troops more than most Marines ever did, most Marine officers ever right. did, at a, at a junior level. Right. Uh, so, you know, is anything I didn't do, you know, I, couldn't have wished for any more. I guess I missed Somalia, but I'm not sure that would have been that much to do anyway. No. Another another hot and dusty place to deploy yeah. to. Um, yeah. Um, you know, maybe uh, it might have been fun to have deployed in Norway, you know, one of, one of those exercises. But no, not really. I think I had a pretty good uh, uh, run in the pool. Yeah. Somebody watches this in 50 or 100 years. What advice would you give them? Young adult. Um, you know, military is not a bad place to start a uh, career as an adult. You know, go to boot camp and you know any services. You know, understand what it's like to be in a team and work with other people, and you know, it, uh, understand the diversity of our nation, and you know, uh, you know learn a learn a trade you may never use again. But um, chance to learn some leadership because you can right. learn leadership a chance to to serve and see some of the world on someone else's dime uh learn about other cultures and other people in the marine corps and or the army or navy or the air force um, I, I think that's a great opportunity i don't believe in universal service i think mm -hmm. i think the military needs volunteers yeah draftees uh, uh i don't think we work in this modern day military it's you require too much training too much equipment to be a to bring someone in for a year and Expect to be a, to be a decent soldier or a sailor or a marine. Um, but I think you know serving the military is a great deal. If you can't do that, you know, become a teacher and teach school. You know, I, but uh, that's a, that's the advice I would give. Yeah. You know, don't disregard the military as a not maybe not as a career, but as a you know four or five or six year you know chance to learn about yourself and uh, uh, meet other people. Yeah. You said your father was was the army. Father was Army. Why? Uh, why did you elect the Marine Corps? Why not follow? Why not follow in Dad's footsteps? So, uh, my father uh, joined the Army as a private in 1946. Uh, won an appointment to West Point. Uh, graduated from West Point as an infantry officer. Uh, was a battalion commander in Vietnam. Uh, Silver Star, Purple Heart. You know, he was my hero. But uh, when I got to college, I joined Army ROTC. And uh, this was uh, 73, 74. It just wasn't wasn't challenging. Yeah. So I came home one day, and my father was running ROTC at Princeton. I said, Dad, you know, this ROTC isn't very good. I'm not enjoying it at all. It's not challenging. He said, Well, have you thought about the Marine Corps? And I said, What? Well, they have this program called the Platoon Leaders Course, where you go to summer camps and go to kind of a you know, combination of boot camp and officer evaluation training and uh, you need to try that and you know if you don't like it you go back to ROTC 
So I signed up for the PLC program and spent my first summer at Camp Upshur just uh, over the over the yeah. woods there and, and uh, was enthralled. And uh, after that, couldn't go back to the Army. Yeah. And uh, uh, I have two brothers. My little brother, Murray, uh, spent 30 years in the Navy as a submariner. Uh, and uh, my dad was very proud of him. So, so dad was right dad was right <laughs> well sir on behalf of the americans of wartime experience thank you very much for sitting down and telling us your story sharing your experiences okay i appreciate uh, it yep and uh, more importantly thank you for your service thank you